So as we began talking last week about the Christian and, and mental illness, and, and really, uh, I would prefer to call this the Christian and mental health, uh, but we, we tend to worry about mental illness. Um, as we talked about last week, the, the health of the actual brain structure determines whether or not there's mental illness. Uh, if you read Daniel Amen's book, uh, one of his books is... Uh, Change your brain, change your life. Talks about the seven structures of the brain. And uh, if those primary structures get damaged in any way, shape, or form, they can affect lots of things. Uh, in his recent book, um, The End of Mental Illness, he basically says, you know, you get two guys, they go to the same theater of war, they see the same combat, they're both lucky enough to come home. Uh, one guy may get post-traumatic stress disorder, the other guy may not. We've got to look at their history. This guy played high school football, received repeated brain injuries. He was in a car wreck and, and, and hurt his head. Uh, maybe he was in a, a, a boxing match and, and got knocked out. A lot of the things that happen with our brain structure affect whether or not we are susceptible to mental illness. So true mental illness is an actual disease or damage to the actual hardware. The organ of the brain. And your brain is an organ. No different than your liver or your kidneys or your heart. And when it's damaged, it manifests in certain ways. Uh, typically, like we talked about last week, it could be with a psychotic disorder. That's a person who has difficulty in their relationships with reality. It could be a mood disorder. That's a person who has difficulties regulating their own moods. Or it could be a personality disorder and those are folks who have difficulties in their relationships with relationships. So as advertised, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about limit setting. I'm a person in a church or in a company or in a neighborhood or in a family. And we've got a person who manifests behaviors or symptomology of some type of mental illness. Now typically, folks who are manifesting psychotic episodes or psychotic symptoms, that's pretty easy to deal with. Uh, folks who are, say, suffering from schizophrenia. And schizophrenia means the split mind. Now, that doesn't mean it's a multiple personality disorder. It doesn't mean it's a dissociative identity disorder. It means their mind is separated from reality. Those folks will have hallucinations. They could have delusions. Uh, they could be catatonic schizophrenia. But the manifestations of that behavior Pretty easy to see, pretty easy to tell. Medication, repeated therapy, and a strong family structure is going to give you some modulation of that. About a 15% recovery rate. Uh, lots of folks who are doing the proper adherence to their medication and therapy live somewhat productive lives, but it's, it's a lifelong deal. A person with a, a mood disorder is either going to have a severe depression, they're going to have dysthymia, or they're going to have uh, bipolar, which is extreme highs and extreme lows. And the extreme lows, they're very, very at risk for suicidal ideation. Extreme highs, they're very at risk for self-destructive behavior. That's not overtly suicidal, but it's self-damaging. And, and learning to deal with folks who are manic uh, is part of what we're going to discuss tonight. The other part of that is the personality disorders. And without going through the shopping list of personality disorders, those are the, the, the mental difficulties that are the most challenging to deal with as a therapist and the most challenging to deal with as a person who has an acquaintance, a boyfriend, a family member, or a congregant that's dealing with that. Because understanding that if it's a true mental illness, the brain structure is damaged. But sometimes people act this way and it's an adaptive behavior. I, for whatever reason, trauma, family of origin, or just coping skills, I've learned that this behavior gets me these rewards, help me survive, and I use that and it becomes a pervasive pattern. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about limit setting. We're not talking about, and I don't want you to hear an unchristian or an uncaring view that says, 
here's a person with a diagnosable illness, and you should use, I'm talking about people who look like they have an illness, but maybe are, are maladaptive in their approach. Is everybody on the same page with that? Which means yes. It means no. <laughs> okay. So, real quick, look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. While you're turning to 1 Samuel 21, we don't get a lot of episodes of mental illness in the Bible. Uh, I think Nebuchadnezzar and his break with reality when he lives out in the pasture with the wild beast, maybe some kind of a fugue episode. Uh, it, there's something going on with him that happened in his brain, and, and his sanity returns to him. That's in his own letter. He said, when my sanity came back to me, uh, I think you have the distressing spirit from God, which overtakes Saul. Now, you've got to understand, the Hebrew idiom, a distressing spirit from God, is their way of saying this happened. It doesn't necessarily say God did it. Okay? That's just their way of saying those kind of things. And I think you could probably make a case that Saul probably suffered from some type of an anxiety disorder. Because he was worried about his status as a warrior king. What makes him feel very, very uncomfortable? Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. Saul was Big Ten. David was SEC. That's all you can say about that. Well, I'm sorry. I, just, I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, so 1 Samuel chapter 22. Because of this paranoia and because of this anxiety from Saul... David is at odds and he runs away. Saul ends up in the hometown of Goliath. He ends up with the king of the Philistines. And David's reputation has slain his thousands, his ten thousands. Those are all Philistines. So he's in the enemy's camp looking for some kind of uh, security, some kind of respite, some kind of place while he's running from Saul. Um, verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 21. Then David arose and fled that day before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Gath is Goliath's hometown. By the way, when David runs to Ahimelech, the, the chapter before this, he says, I'm on an urgent mission from Saul and my men and I have left. Do you have anything to eat? They let him eat the holy bread. He says, and by the way, we left town so fast, ah, forgot our weapons. Do you have any weapons here? The priest says, you know, I've got one weapon here. It's the sword of Goliath, whom you slew. It's wrapped in an ephod. And David's personal battle weapon, the thing he carries into war, is the battle sword of Goliath. And the first place he goes is Goliath's hometown. Just taking a left. You talk about a bad dude. Picture yourself walking downtown Gath. And I think Goliath's a giant, so his sword is big. So you wear it on your back, not your hip. You go walking downtown Gath with the, the battle sword of their dead champion strapped between your shoulders. Folks, the level of David's badness is off the chain. So he goes downtown Gath with their dead champion's battle sword. And anybody who knew anything about Goliath would have went, I think I reckon. You're walking downtown Tuscaloosa with the, with the crystal football. <laughs> and you're going, nanny nanny boo boo, this is not yours. And those guys who are Alabama fans tell me if it ain't got a ring, it don't mean a thing. It's what they tell me about certain games. That's who David is. So he's there. He's in Gath, and he attaches himself to the king. Verse 11, And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in their dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousand? David walks into town, and they recognize him. And the rumor mill starts, Hey, isn't this their guy? Isn't this their champion? Isn't... Boy, that sword looks familiar. All of a sudden, they're identifying David, and David's not here with anonymity. Maybe David thinks he's just going to show up as a mercenary and get lost in the crowd. Now, David took these words to heart. And he was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. 
So he changed his behavior before them and pretended madness in their hands. He scratched at the doors of the gate. He let saliva fall down on his beard. And Achish said to his servants, Look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David takes on the symptoms of mental illness. And why does he take on the symptoms of mental illness? As an adaptive survival mechanism to keep him from getting killed by this king. There are people who, for whatever reason, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, who feign the behavior of the mentally ill because it works for them. You say, but how can you say that? Well, you find somebody who's had this pervasive pattern of disrupted relationships and bad functioning for, for 15 or 20 years and they end up in my office and we begin to talk about how they interact with people and they've got a broken string of relationships. They don't maintain jobs. Uh, they, they have a lot of self-absorbed rather than self-aware. And you go, well, you know, basically this behavior you have is a survival mechanism, and it's adaptive. And, and you go, does this work for you? Most people who are in therapy will try to accommodate you and go, no, it doesn't work. I go, well, yes, it does, because you're still sitting here. You've survived up to this point. Now, are you thriving? That's up for question. But they did make it to that point, so a part of their behavior has worked in some way. And that's the difficult part is, would I turn loose of a behavior that sort of works? You ever tried to correct your golf swing? Yep, yeah, but I can, one out of every ten, I, you know. If it works sometimes, you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. So let's talk about what we should understand about healthy behavior and maybe about some possible limits we set on unhealthy behavior. If you look at Romans chapter 12, and that's, I know that may be a stretch, Paul in writing to the Christians at Rome, has a, has a monumental task. You've got two groups of people. The first group of people are, are your Jews. They were raised in the tradition of Moses. They were promised the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, they felt like they were kind of the in crowd. And so when the Gentiles started coming into the church, there, there was a little bit of prejudicial behavior between the Jews and the Gentiles. Tongue-in-cheek, accommodative language for our purposes. The, the Jewish Christians led singing. The Jewish Christians made the announcements. The Jewish Christians had the keys to the church chariot. The Gentile Christians just kind of sat in the back. Well, because Judaism and Christianity were closely identified, when the Caesar began to persecute the Christians and made the Christians leave Rome, primarily the group of people who ran out of Rome were Jewish and so you've got this small enclave or this small pocket of Gentile Christians who remain at the church. So now on a typical Sunday morning when all the Jews are out of town, the Gentile Christians lead singing, the Gentile Christians make the announcements, and they had the keys to the church chariot. The Jews come back, and now it's reverse discrimination. Hey, you guys had the law, you guys had the covenant, you guys got the Messiah, and you murdered him, by the way. And now there's this one-upmanship... So Paul writes these Christians a letter and says it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not circumcised. Everybody who's ever lived long enough to choose right or wrong has chosen wrong. And everybody's got a sin problem. And the only way to deal with the sin problem is through God's grace and God's love and God's mercy. And he spends up to chapter 10 talking to the Jews and the Gentiles about this is how God saves people, this is faith, this is grace, this is how you respond to this. In chapter 9, he talks about, I wished Israel could be saved, but you know what? So sometimes God has to vent His wrath, and, and, and it's not that He takes free will away from people, but that people fall into a role of their own choosing. And then the very last part of Romans chapter of, of the book of Romans, what we have in the English Bible, Chapter 12 is a very practical, almost as practical as the book of James, hands-on, this is how healthy people in the church treat each other. 
This is how you treat each other. Chapter 13, this is how Christians behave in relationship to your civil government. And then in chapter 14, this is how Christians behave who come from two different traditions. This person can only eat meat, this person can't. This person drinks wine, this person doesn't. This person thinks this is a holy day, this person doesn't. And so he goes, this is how you treat each other, this is how you treat civil government, and this is how you get along in a congregation when your backgrounds and your traditions are not the same. Super, super practical section in Rome where, where Paul's kind of wrapping up some stuff. And so as we look at chapter 12, Paul basically makes some assumptions about this is how healthy people behave. So for our purposes, we'll look and analyze how do healthy people behave. And if people aren't behaving this way, it may be because of a personality disorder or it may be because of a personality maladaption. And what do we do about it? So Romans chapter 12. I beg you, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul says, I'm going to ask a big favor of you. I'm going to, I'm going to put something on the table. And I'm going to ask for something big. I want you to take your life and let it become a sacrifice. Now, when Paul talks about living sacrifice, he doesn't want you to burn up. He wants you to burn out. I want you to use everything you do as a worship toward God. Not in the, 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 the sense of a technical corporate worship, but I want you to use everything you do as a sacrifice toward God. Now, I can ask you that. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. He spent six chapters. Grace and faith, grace and faith, grace and faith. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were powerless, Christ died for us. Paul demonstrates that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. But your behavior demonstrates whether or not you love God. And he says, so I'm going to ask you to, to give yourself as a sacrifice. And the card I'm going to play to ask you to do this is don't think about what God can do to you. Think about what God has done for you. And if you ever get that, on any level, this is what God has done for me. I won't live like the world does. And the reason I won't live like the world, I won't be conformed, I'll be transformed. The transformation takes place by the renewing of our mind. If you change the way you think, you change the way you live. People who don't have the capacity to alter their thinking are mentally ill. People who don't have the capacity to alter their thinking can't conform to the will of God. So Paul is, there's an assumption, although he's not talking about it, we're extrapolating. Paul's talking about people who fall under the bell curve. This is normal people. And if you have the capacity to have self-awareness rather than being self-absorbed, you can look at the world differently by looking at what God's done for you, not what God's going to do to you, and I can live a certain way. And so he says, I want you to give your bodies a living sacrifice and don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed in your mind and your thinking transforms to what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. People who are not aware of the will of God are not accountable to the will of God if it's because of a brain damage. You would not hold a two-year-old accountable to the covenant. Nor would you hold somebody who has the mental capacity of a two-year-old to be responsible for the covenant. So Paul's talking to people who have self-efficacy. He's talking to people who have the ability of self-regulation. And then he says in verse 3, For I say to you through the grace given to me, that everyone among you is not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly as God has dealt to each of us a measure of faith. Paul says the first thing I want you to do is to be self-aware, not self-absorbed. Now, any time you start talking about personality disorders, guess what's going to come up? Narcissism, histrionic, and that's, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. Paul says, first thing I want you to do is understand that we can't, as people of God, people who've been giving our lives as a sacrifice, we're not supposed to think of ourselves as bigger than we are. He'll do the same thing in Philippians 2, change the way you see yourself, change the way you see others. 
So as Paul talks about healthy living, one of the markers for healthy living is, do we have a very accurate measure of who we are? And, and that's not too high, and it's not too low, but it's getting a self-image and a self-esteem based on God. I'm created in the image of God, and Jesus died for me. That gives me inherent value and inherent worth. And people who can comprehend that are accountable for their behaviors. People who can't aren't. So Paul says, I want you to understand that by the grace given to me, I don't want you to think, I don't want you to elevate what you think about yourself, and I want you to be sober. And then he says, and let me put, put that in, in, in perspective for you. If you think about yourself soberly, then you understand how you fit systemically. In Stephen Glenn's book, Raising Self-Reliant Children in a Self-Indulgent World, he said one of the skill sets you have to have in order to become a self-reliant person is you have to have systemic skills. And systemic skills are basically understanding how I fit in any system, a family, a church, community, or a government. Paul uses this as an example. For, verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, but all the bodies do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ. And individually, members of one another. Paul said there's an interconnectedness in Christianity. And in the same way that there's a system in your body, there's a system in the church. And your value doesn't come from the specific role that you play. Your value comes from the simple fact that you have a role. And you can't say, well, I'm this and you're not, or you're this and I'm not. It's a balance of what is my participation in the body. Interdependence. Not dependent, not independent, but interdependent. And notice how he describes this. Having then gifts, this is verse 6, having then gifts differing again from, to the grace that is given to us, let's use them. Whatever it is that you can do, you do. Now, this is not on the mental health topic, but listen how Paul talks about church leadership. If prophecy, let him prophesy in proportion to his faith. If it's ministry, and ministry there means service, not up front, out loud, wearing a tie with a title, okay? Ministry is, if it's ministry, use it in your ministering. If it's teaching, then use your gift in teaching. Those are the only three traditional leadership roles that we see. Notice what else he says about leadership in the church. If it's in exhortation, or giving, or leading, or mercy. You got a deacon in charge of encouragement? Is there a, a, a men's charge of mercy? See, when Paul says, if you're going to lead this body, now he talks about some traditional stuff. You, you, you got a guy who can prophesy, you, you, you got a guy who can teach, you got a guy who, who ministers, who serves. But then what Paul talks about really is encouraging, giving, Leading and showing mercy. That's real church leadership right there. Paul says healthy people treat each other this way. If you think in, in terms of attention, belonging, and support. Paul says if you be belong to a body and you are a healthy part of that body, you will not be self-absorbed, you'll be self-aware. And in being self-aware, you become other aware. And look what I do. I encourage other people. It's not just about me. I give. I share. And I'm going to do that with liberality. If I'm a person of influence, I'm going to recognize that my leadership requ requires some responsibility. So I'm going to have diligence in that. And, and then if I'm going to show mercy and forgive folks, I'm going to do that cheerfully. Paul talks about church leadership in a non-traditional standpoint here in, in that he says that our leadership in the church is... Essentially how we treat each other. And it has very little to do with programs and being a program director. So then, he says, so here's some basic rules for how you exhort and how you love and how you forgive and how you give. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Now what does that mean? That means I'm not a manipulator. I'm not going to use my affection for you or my liking of you or my value of you with any strings attached to it. Unhealthy people hold other people hostage with their love, their happiness, and their approval. Healthy people love 
and they love without hypocrisy. Healthy people love people and there's no strings attached to that. But any time that I'm making you feel like you've got to earn my love, I'm either manipulating you or controlling you and manipulation and control are abuse. Without exception. And so Paul says when you look at a healthy person and you see how a healthy member of the body behaves, number one, leadership is different than you think. And then number two, when you love, I want you to love without any strings attached. How many times have you been involved with unhealthy people and there was always, if I do something for you, it comes with a string. If I give you something, I get, a manage, I get some modicum of control. If I offer you this gift, I get to tell you how you use it. And Paul says, when you love people, you love people without hypocrisy. Now here's how you love without hypocrisy. You abhor what is evil. You cling to what is good. You're kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And in honor, you give preference to one another. So when I start interacting with you, if I'm a healthy person, my love doesn't come with strings attached. I don't love you if, I don't love you when, I don't love you because, I love you, period. And I do that so that I am kindly affectionate towards you. And I'm going to give you preference. It's not all about me. People who can't be in the, the second tier, people who can't play second fiddle, people who can't let you celebrate, it's always got to be about them. They're either suffering from a borderline personality disorder or they're histrionic. And you run into those folks where it doesn't matter what's going on, it has to be about them. If you're having surgery, they've got to talk about their surgery while you're having surgery. If you're at a funeral, they've got to talk about when their aunt died, not that your aunt died. And they've all got to have that attention. It's all got to come. And Paul says, look, you've got to understand that you're giving brotherly love and you're giving preference to the other person. You're not the most important person in the room. This is not about you. And so Paul is describing healthy personalities and at the same time giving us a picture of the unhealthy personalities. He says, uh, not, verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, steadily in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, and given to hospitality. He says, you know, when you encounter bad situations, people who are connected to the body and the body's connected to them, what happens is that, that they, they're not lagging in diligence. Dysfunctional people lack motivation. Remember last week we talked about self-regulation, delayed gratification, impulse control, and motivation. You can't be diligent if you have a deficit in motivation. So Paul says healthy people are productive. Healthy people make a contribution to the system that they're a part of. Healthy people are, are diligent and they're fervent in their spirit. They have a good attitude. There's, it's not constantly, you've you, you got to pick them up. It, it's not constantly that you've got to reinforce them. They have the self-efficacy to operate on their own. Essentially, it's they're comfortable with who they are. They're comfortable with who they're not. And unhealthy people are always draining energy from you to say, hey, prop me up, make me feel good about who I am. When you become a member of, of the Lord's church, you've entered into a relationship with the body. And at some point, you have to go from being a project to being a partner. And sometimes we never want to, you know, people have placed memberships at churches and said, well, you know, when I was visiting here, you guys courted me real hot and heavy. And then all of a sudden, I placed membership. Nobody had anything to do with me. Well, we expect you to go to work. <laughs> we expected you to start taking people out to dinner rather than everybody taking you out to dinner. We expected you to start visiting other people's houses rather than everybody coming to see you. That's what happens when you become a member. And so Paul says, I, you've got to do your part. And, and there's a difference in having a responsibility for someone and having a responsibility to someone. We have responsibilities to each other, but not for each other. Because if, you're, if you make your success or your failure my fault, then you don't have any accountability. And, and I'm unwilling to be responsible for something I don't control. And so Paul says, you've got to be diligent You've got to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, and patient in tribulation. I don't know anybody who's tribulation free. I just don't. And sometimes I see the things that can happen to people, and the things that do happen to people, and I go, you know, I've really not had any real difficulties in my life. 
And my wife points out, don't you remember when this happened? And don't you? And he's like, okay, everybody has trouble. If our disease, whatever it is, becomes our identity, if our diagnosis becomes our identity, if our tragedy becomes our identity, we're not being healthy. The things that happen to us don't define us. The things that happen to us make us part of the human club. We live in a world controlled by physics and corrupted by sin. This thing's supposed to wear out. Period. And if we are not patient in tribulation, if we always make it... Ex now, we're not saying you can't be sad. We're not saying you can't be discouraged. We're not saying there, there's not things that affect our psyche. There are not things that, that, that shouldn't affect... Bad things should affect us, but they don't become our identity. And dysfunctional, unhealthy people say, this is my whatever, and that's my get-out-of-jail-free card. I get to act this way, I get to be this way, I get to do this way, because I have X circumstance. Our circumstances do not give us our identity. Read Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, you have people of faith. And in part of that chapter... The dead are raised, they kill lions, they survive the fire, they, they run off armies of invaders. Others are tortured, would not be released. They fed the lions, lived in goat skins, were cut in half. They had the same faith. Their faith did not change their circumstances. But they did not allow their circumstances to control their faith. And that's the big part. So Paul says... This is how you treat people. This is your attitude. And when you run into trouble, your trouble doesn't define you. And people who are defined by their circumstances, people who are defined by their situations, it's, it's almost like it's a victim mentality. This happened to me, so I get this. Um, it's almost a national group think. In our, in, in our society today, and I'll get in trouble for this, I guess, but, but our society today reminds me of the Jews who had this, this, this nationwide denial. Jesus said, if you hear my words, you'll be free. And the Jews said, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves to anybody. Do you forget about 430 years in Egypt? You forget about the Babylonians, the Medo-Persian Empire, and you understand you're living in Roman-occupied territory right here, right now. <laughs> but in their minds, we've never been a slave to anybody. We've always been free. We've been, and now we've got a group of people in our society who says we've never been anything but slaves. That's a victim mentality. And if your past has to define your future, then we don't have free will. And people who are not patient in tribulation, have this identity that says, my tragedy defines who I am, and, and that's not being very healthy. Then he gets into some interpersonal stuff. Verse 14, this is how healthy people treat other people. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Healthy people don't walk around in their lives with unfinished business. Healthy people... Don't take the offensive that other people do and say, because you've done this to me, I now have to do this to you. Healthy people understand, you know what? I'm an imperfect person. I married an imperfect person. We gave birth to a person, and when she got old enough, she became an imperfect person. I live in a neighborhood of imperfect people. I go to church with imperfect people. I work with imperfect people, and I'm self-employed. Okay? We, we have imperfect people. Why do we lose our minds when an imperfect person acts imperfectly? Why does that derail us? My wife is going to retire, Lord willing, in December. And her retirement project is, she didn't think she was going to coach any more volleyball, so she says, you know what I need for my retirement project? I need a new dog. And rather than waiting till she retired, since we weren't going back to school after March, we got our dog early. Drove to North Carolina during the zombie apocalypse and picked up a Spanish water dog named Oreo. Well, guess what happens when you bring Oreo to your house and she's a six-week-old puppy? Everything that she can reach, she'll chew on. 
Period. And if you leave a drawer open, she's going to grab a prize and take off with it. Why is this dog doing this? It's a dog. Why does this puppy act this way? It's a puppy. And if you're going to be frustrated with that, don't have one in your house. How do imperfect people react? We get scared. We get selfish. And I take it out on you. So when somebody does something bad to you and somebody is imperfect, how do healthy people respond? I bless you. I don't curse you. I give you some love. I give you some grace. I recognize that you're not perfect. And I'm going to take a big left turn here. Matthew chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, go to your brother, him alone, and tell him his fault. You guys familiar with that? Please read that carefully. When your brother sins against you. Something's going on between us, and, and, and if it's not addressed, it's a heaven or hell issue. And if it has nothing to do with heaven or hell, I need to grow up and get over it. How many times have we weaponized Matthew 18 says, you know, you got in my parking space. You didn't, you didn't give my kid a bigger graduation present. We gave yours. You didn't come to my daughter's baby shower and we came to yours. And we carry this junk with us. Matthew 18 is not a hunting license. Matthew 18 says, there's a scriptural mandate that if it involves heaven or hell, you talk to somebody. But if it doesn't involve heaven or hell, grow up, get over it, let it go. Quit carrying around these grudges. Bless those who persecute you. Whether it's on purpose or inadvertently, bless them and do not curse them. Verse 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Again, he's saying, understand that when other people are in these circumstances, you participate with them. You don't always have to have the limelight. You don't always have to have the attention. You don't always have to be the center focus. If somebody is good for him, quit being jealous. Rejoice with people who rejoice. Be comfortable when people are sad and you can mourn with them. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to make it all better. And your tragedy doesn't have to be worse than theirs. He's talking about healthy people live in balance with other people. Notice he says, be of the same mind. Put yourself in their shoes. The ability for empathy, for our interactions not to be this way, but our interactions to be this way is a sign of health. Because I listen to you, I understand you, and I accept you, and then we get alignment. People who can't align with other people, and it's always about me, about me, about me, about me, are not healthy people. And they're not good to be around. They're toxic. And then he says, be willing to associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own opinion. I think he's talking about folks who would be described as narcissists. Maybe even if you get a real technical definition, you don't want to talk, to, you, you want to talk about people with a borderline personality disorder. Paul gives, this is how healthy people act. And if you look at the descriptions for these diseases or these dysfunctions, it's going to be the opposite of how Christians treat each other. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. We're not in charge of making the books balance. I, I, I don't have to pay you type in kind for what happens. I'm supposed to forgive you and move on. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Rather than looking at the bad, rather than looking at how you did me, rather than looking for the negative, I need to be looking toward the positive. And you'll find out that positive people are happier and negative people are less happy. How much time do you like to spend with somebody who all they do is complain? How much time do you like to spend with somebody who can't see the good in anything? Paul says, this is how healthy people behave. And then he says in verse 18, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. Now, don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. It is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. In doing this, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul says, and you're dealing with other people, healthy 
Christian people don't worry about revenge. Healthy Christian people don't try to say, okay, you did this to me and I've got to do this to you. You treated my family this way and if I have to wait 10 years, I'm going to get some payback here. How many companies have you seen ruined? How many churches have you seen ruined when somebody had an axe to grind and decided, now that I'm a deacon, now that I'm an elder, I'll pay this guy back for this. If you've been in the church very long, you've seen it. And Paul simply says, you, you, you treat people counterintuitively. If your enemy's hungry, you feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him a drink. In doing this, you might cause him to repent. That's what it means to heap burning coals on his head. It was an Egyptian sign of repentance. And then he just simply says probably the, the healthiest thing is do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, when Paul describes this is how mature Christians act, you'll notice that everything that is spiritually mature looks like a healthy person. And I think that's phenomenal that the Bible is not necessarily talking about mental health or mental illness. It's talking about spiritual maturity. People who have the ability to mature spiritually but choose not to are not mentally ill. They're maladaptive. People who cannot mature spiritually are probably mentally ill. And that's it. Now, the one verse that we kind of read through, and, and I may be making more of this than I should. And, and I recognize that as, as a behavioral therapist, that when I read this, it makes bells go off for me. But in the middle of this discussion, Paul says, if it is possible, verse 18, if it's possible... That indicates what? It might not be possible on some occasions. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you. There's only a half of this thing that I actually control. If I'm a healthy person, and I'm dealing with other healthy people, it's probably possible, and my part of it works pretty well. But what happens if I'm dealing with somebody who's not healthy? What happens if I'm dealing with somebody who is dangerous? Somebody who is toxic? Somebody who is going to cause damage physically, intellectually, emotionally, or spiritually? What if I'm dealing with somebody and through their choice or, or just lack of capacity, they're a danger to the spiritual well-being of my children? Or financially ruined? Sexually molesting children. If possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. I do believe, and, and, and I could be wrong, I may read more into this, but I do believe that as Paul talks about, here's how you get along with people, he says, you've got people under the bell curve and people who live under the bell curve, this is how you act. But there's some folks that are outliers. You can't have these folks as neighbors. You can't have these folks as boyfriends and girlfriends. You can't have these folks in certain situations. Now, I hope that doesn't sound unchristian. I hope that doesn't sound uncaring. I hope that in delivering this, I'm trying to be factual, I'm trying to be intellectually honest. I hope it doesn't sound cavalier. But there are some people that as healthy people, we have to put some limits on. Um, I, I wrote a little book uh, for a group of guys that I work out with. It's, it's the cage fighting crowd. <laughs> and a lot of those young people, if you're 57 and you go to a jiu-jitsu gym, you're old. I mean, they, you know, they expect me to come in on a walker. So I'm hanging out with this crowd of guys and some top-notch, super people who are a little lost sometimes in some other bounces in their lives. And so I, I wrote a book called Grappling with Life. Controlling your inside space. If you're a jiu-jitsu guy and you get on the mat with somebody, you don't want anybody getting between your elbows and your knees. That's your inside space. And a jiu-jitsu guy, when he hears the term controlling your inside space, knows exactly what we're talking about. Well, I wrote 
this little essay to talk about controlling your inside space, your heart, your soul, and your head. And there's a couple of simple principles in this little book. One of those is to manage the strength and quality of your connections. If we're wrestling, and I let you grab me, if you, if you grab my wrist, or if you get my shirt, or if you can grab my trunks, and you can tangle, you can turn a connection into an entanglement. Oh, that's terrible. There's a little move you do with a, it's, a, it, it's called a leg entanglement. The Japanese word ashigurami means leg entanglement. If I get you in a leg entanglement, I cripple you. I put about six pounds of pressure on the outside of your heel, and you'll have ACL surgery tonight. By the time you know to tap, it's already broken. There are people who tangle themselves up in our lives and they cripple us. You've got to manage the quality and the duration of some of your connections. And that doesn't mean you can't have anything to do, but there's got to be some distance. And if I can maintain the distance between us and I can protect the connections and make them healthy connections or maintain the duration of those connections... I can maintain a relationship with you. But at any point that you invade the inside space and you make me responsible for things I don't control, if you make me responsible for your health or your happiness or your spirituality or your success or your mood or your addiction, that's a soul-crushing pressure. Again, one of those principles from the jiu-jitsu book. It's called top pressure. If we start wrestling and I can get you in a position where you're holding up all my weight, your hands are on the floor, your feet are on the floor, keeping my weight. If I make you responsible for my weight, you're doing nothing for yourself. Your hands aren't busy doing what they need to do to defend yourself. And that soul-stealing pressure of, you've got me responsible for all this pressure. And, and if I'm in a relationship with somebody and I catch myself walking on light bulbs, I used to talk about walking on eggshells. This is a different level. I'm walking on light bulbs. Because i got to be careful not to make you mad. If I do this, they'll drink. If I do that, they'll hit me. If you've got somebody who says, I'm going to make you responsible for something you really don't control, that is a smothering, soul-stealing pressure. And if you're in a relationship with somebody who says, you're causing me to do this, you need to challenge that concept. You need to challenge that construct. If, and that's, that's a big, huge word, you know, 32 font, black ink. If I could make you mad, I could make you happy. If I had the power to make you leave the church, I could make you sit right there every Sunday. If I could make you drink, I could make you sober. If I could make you cheat, I could make you faithful. If I could make you kill yourself, I could keep you alive. Why would I do things in your life that give me bad results if I'm in charge? That'd be as silly as me calling Jackie and she says, Hey, you're in charge of supper tonight. And I go, Ugh, not broccoli again. Well, if I'm in charge of supper, there'd be no broccoli in the house. Okay? It's, everything I eat eats vegetables, so I kind of get them indirectly <laughs> the way I see it. But I'm in charge of your mood, so you're mad. No, if I'm in charge of your mood, you're happy. I'm in charge of your addiction, so you're drinking again. No, if I'm in charge of your addiction, you're stone cold sober. Understanding that there are some situations that as Christians, we get entangled with people who either on purpose, unconsciously, or because of mental illness, make us be responsible for things we can't control. Unhealthy connections that turn into entanglements. And then they try to control things that don't belong to them. Your success, your happiness, your validation, and your approval. And if you make me responsible for things I don't control, and I let you control things that don't belong to me, you can cripple me. If I let you control my wrist, my elbow, my shoulder, my knee, or my ankle, you cripple me. And in any case that you're involved with a person, and that involvement is toxic to the level that they are crippling you, I think Romans chapter 12 says, as much as possible, as much as it depends on you, you live at peace with these people. 
And sometimes being at peace with those people means we got quite a bit of distance. Okay? Hey, Mom, Dad, we can come to your house at Thanksgiving, but we're going to stay in a hotel. That way if Dad starts again, we can just go back to the hotel. It ain't like we grabbed all the kids and packed all our luggage and rolled up our sleeping bags and left. Oh, look, it's 1030. We're going back to Motel 6. We'll be back in the morning. Now, at some point, if it gets bad enough, we check out of Motel 6, and there's not a scene. Hey, look, I can meet with you for dinner. We meet on neutral ground. That way, you're not at my house, and I'm not kicking you out, and I'm not at your house, and I'm not storming out. But we'll meet for about an hour, and if you start this behavior again, oh, look, check, please. And we leave. Not saying I can't have anything to do with you, but also saying I'm not going to give you the ability to entangle me, control me, manipulate me. And at some place, as much as possible, as much as it depends on you, you've got to ask yourself, is this toxic? Is this hurting me physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually? And I will probably tolerate three of those four. But I'm probably not going to tolerate spiritual damage. I'm not going to allow what goes on between us to, 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 to compromise my salvation or my children's salvation or my spouse's salvation. And that's a family member, that's a job, that's even a congregation. If there's a level of toxicity and the other person either can't repent, doesn't have the capacity to change, or won't change, I think it falls under the purview of if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. Now, when you set limits on people, it can't be vindictive. It can't be, I'm going to pay you back. That violates everything in Romans 12. It can't be punitive. I'm going to hurt you because you hurt me. Violates everything in Romans chapter 12. And it can't be, I'm going to do this so you'll do that. That's manipulative. This simply is about logical consequences. If you drink while the grandkids are there, the kids and I are leaving. You and mom start in on each other where the grandkids are there. That's an unhealthy environment. We're probably going to go back to the motel room. You can come. But you can't stay here. Because there's just that dynamic. And, and, and it's not, I'm going to do this and make you do that. It's simply, this is the healthy parameters for us to have a relationship. The Apostle Paul is arrested and they stretch him between two soldiers and are about to beat him. And Paul says, can, can you beat a Roman citizen who hasn't had a trial? And everybody freezes. In fact, they leave the poor centurion by himself. <laughs> they threw him under the bus. <laughs> so, you know, are you a Roman citizen? Yeah. Hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I paid a great price for this. Paul said, I was born one. Paul, on three occasions, says, I'm a citizen of Rome, and you can't treat me. He tells the magistrates in Philippi, they want me to leave. You tell them to come march me out. You beat me without a trial. and You publicly humiliated me in front of this city. You've compromised my ministry. Y'all want me to leave. You come escort me out of town. And then the Jews tell Festus, hey, we want this guy to come from Caesarea back to Jerusalem so we can interview him. And they're planning to assassinate him. And Paul goes, you know, I really technically can go see the Caesar. And I'll see the Caesar before I go back to Jerusalem. Three different occasions, Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. and You can't treat me this way. Now, Paul would suffer for the kingdom. Paul would get beat, shipwrecked, stoned. But three occasions, even in Paul's ministry, he said, I'm a Roman citizen, and I'm going to set some limits on your behavior. I honestly believe, and that's Alani Jones' opinion, that as citizens of the kingdom, and as citizens of our nation, you have some rights that say, you, you can't beat me and not talk to a sheriff's deputy. You can't have this illegal, addicted behavior in my home and me and the children stay there. You can't be a narcissist or, or, or treat me like a person does who has a, a borderline personality disorder and expect us to be manipulated by you. I think we have rights as kingdom citizens. And Romans 13 says, hey, your, your country has laws and the lawgivers and the law enforcers, they don't wear that sword because it's decoration. You don't want to see the genie, don't rub the bottle. 
And I think there's a, a real scriptural mandate that says as you and I deal with healthy people, these are the parameters. As we deal with toxic people who are unhealthy, there are also some parameters as much as possible, as much as it depends on you. Live at peace with all people. Thank you for, for studying with me. I know that's a lot to absorb in, in one session. We'll uh, wrap up our series next week and probably just talk about how Christians respond to crisis. When we're in unfortunate circumstances or things happen to us, what is our mindset? What do we do to deal and give us a view of the Christian and mental health more than the Christian and mental illness? Let's pray together. Oh.